Now we're going to hear from Martin Hay, and he's going to talk about restoring copy protection to a cracked disk. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> so we're going to try to get back to 3.59 a.m., the moment before 4 a.m. cracked the disk. Um, and the particular disk we're going to uncrack today is, oh, I guess URLs are in lowercase. Mm. So it's on archive.org, like all of 4AM's cracks. And it's called Gertrude's Puzzles. Version 1.2, a 4AM crack. That's the URL. Um, and the, the text file description of that crack, uh, you can access it online, but I, I'm also going to reference it here. So what 4AM is, is doing, in essence, is removing copy protection. Now, he's trying to do it in such a way that, to, that it changes the minimal amount of, your orig of the original disk, but it's still changing something. And so when you download that disk from the Internet Archive and put it on a floppy and run it on your Apple II, it looks a lot. It looks like the original, but it is not. It, it, is, it is subtly different. And if, if the copy protection was really interesting, like it made the drive chatter between quarter tracks, that's gone. So it's kind of fun to, to put it back. So why do this? Because it's fun. Because it's KFest. Um, I tried to think of a practical reason. And I was like, you could restore a damaged original disk. Yeah. Say that again? Yeah. It's the retro unbriding. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, this is, this is going to be kind of the light version. I picked a disk intentionally that was fairly simple. Uh, it does not chatter between quarter tracks. That would be insane to try to do in a half hour presentation. Um, first I tried phase word rally. Um, I was like, oh, this is some pretty interesting copy protection. And then I got deeper into it, and I'm like, I don't understand this copy protection at all. It's nothing I've seen before, and I don't even think these bit sequences can be written on a disk 2 drive. So phase word rally was out. <laughs> um, then I tried the Hangtown Trilogy, which is kind of a fun game. Um, uses E7 bitstream copy protection, which is new and cool and hip. <laughs> um, and I got things pretty much working in emulation, and then I, tr I went to try it on my Laser 128, and Hang Hangtown Trilogy doesn't run on a Laser 128. <laughs> the copy protection runs fine. Hang the app itself does not run. Did you say it hangs? It does actually hang. <laughs> so we've got Gertrude's puzzles. Um, So that was kind of an irritating pro process and, and why this presentation wasn't done until last night. Gertrude's Puzzles has the advantage that it runs. It's pretty simple protection, <laughs> and it still uses the fancy hip E7 bitstream. So. What did 4AM give us? Let's take a look at it. So this is a fresh copy. Never uncrack an original. <laughs> no, don't, don't uncrack your original disk because it's just a pain to keep copying it again from the CFFA. 
here's here's what it looks like. So from our perspective this morning, what is happening right now is a bad thing. It's working. There's no copy protection on this disk, and yet the disk is working. So someone damaged this disk. Someone named 4AM damaged this disk. It should not work. OK. So what did 4AM do to it? Let's just review. I'm not going to describe everything in this. Um, there's some interesting features. First of all, this is version 1.2. Each version of Gertrude's puzzles had different copy protection. So I don't know about the other ones. Um, when various copy, protect, copy programs fail in interesting ways, um, EDD fails. This is because of the E7 bit stream that EDD can't copy. EDD 4-bit copy can't copy. Um, also, there are modified epilogues on the data and address fields. And oh, errors on on tracks 12 through the end of the disk, hex 12 through the end of the disk. So basically, half the disk was never formatted. Whereas if you download this and put it on a floppy disk those tracks are formatted. So that's another difference between this disk and the real disk. I lied, actually. This disk, I degaussed upstairs, and then I only copied tracks 1 through hex 11 onto it. Did you use the Nifty Prime decals on that? Did I what? Did you use the Nifty Prime decals on that? No. Is that what it's called? Yes, sir. Yes, I did. I did not use the portable version. I used the one on the door. And it worked. Do you want to see what a degauss track looks like? Yeah. We'll be doing the copy two plus. We'll go to the nibble editor and we'll read track twelve, for instance. Here's what it looks like. Absolute garbage. No pattern discernible. Just trash. But track 11, you probably recognize D5AA96 as the beginning of an address field. Um, he goes through, he saves the DOS, he, go, he uses that DOS against the disk to copy tracks 0 through hex 11. It catalogs, it works, you boot it, it fills the <coughs> screen with garbage because he hasn't found the nibble check. We'll get back to the nibble check in a second. Um, actually, no, let's talk about the nibble check now. Okay. It ends up at 20C in memory. This does a little bit of setup. This is like, I think it's a death counter or something. Turns on the disk motor. Uh, here's the death counter. Ah, part of the setup is it seeks to track uh, hex 11, which is the catalog track in DOS 3.3. And then it goes and and it reads an address field, and it waits until it finds physical sector D, which is logical sector 1, which is unused on virtually all DOS 3.3 disk. So that's a good place to stick your copy protection. It's, it's handy. It's cheap. Once you find sector D address header, you go and you start reading bytes. We're looking for a D5. 
where would you find a D5? After, so here's the address block. Here's the end of the address block. So the D5 is here. It's the beginning of the, of the block of data. Okay? Then we go look for three E7s in a row. One, two, three. Let's find some E7s. I don't see any E7s. Oh, we're on the wrong sector. <laughs> we're not on sector D. <coughs> Whoops, caps lock. Here's sector D. I, I happen to know the magic pattern for finding it. There's the D5. Now let's see if we can find some E7s. Here's one. There they are. Oh, there's more. There's a lot. So it, it looks for three in a row. All right, so now we're here. What does it do next? Kill some time to get out of sync. So it just lets three bits float on by. And then it starts reading data again and it looks for an EE. And I will tell you that that is not here. Copy 2 Plus can tell if there are timing bits between the nibbles. It can't tell how many timing bits there are, but it can tell when there are. And the fact that these are not shown in inverse means there are no timing bits at all. Because this is a standard disk that doesn't have timing bits in the data field. Here's a, here's a bunch of self-sync bytes that do have timing bits because that's how self-sync bytes work. Okay, so our goal will be to put real E7 bitstream with timing bits in it. Um, but we also have one other thing to fix, which is He actually changed two bytes on track zero, sector B, at offset 4E to bypass the protection check entirely. That's why our disk is working instead of crashing. It should crash. So let's go fix those bytes. Why was that? Okay. Sector editor, track zero, sector B. Offset 4E, here's his patch. So instead of calling ADA1, we're going to jump to. It doesn't look quite right, but we're going to see if it works. We're going to jump to the monitor, which is at FF69. Yeah, it's the right desk. All right, Let's see what happens. Okay, instead of booting, it just jumped to the monitor. This code ought to look a little bit familiar. This is the this is the protection check right here. Here's where it's looking for E7 nibbles, et cetera, et cetera. All right, and if we run the copy protection check, what happens? It looks for E7 nibbles. It doesn't find them. It sets the screen to junk and reboots. Right back to the monitor where we wanted it to be. Okay. So we need to put E7s here with proper timing bits. Easy, right? We'll just type that into the mini assembler. No, I'm not going to do that because there's no mini assembler on the Laser 128. We'll just hand assemble it in front of a crowd of people in half an hour. <laughs> we will not do that either because that's crazy. We will use a tool that's made for this purpose, an assembler called Big Mac, which takes a long time to boot because it wants stock DOS 3.3. It doesn't work with 
Pronto DOS or other fast DOSes. Here we go. So I will show you code that I wrote earlier that does the magic stuff. Um, these are addresses of switches on the disk drive. Uh, this is a handy monitor routine that does nothing but return to you. So if you call it, it returns to you and takes 12 cycles total to do so. So that's handy for wasting time. Oh, let's try that again. So we want a routine that can wait exactly the right amount of time and then write a nibble. Why do we need to wait exactly the right amount of time? Close. To skip the zeros is close. What we want to do is, because we're writing bytes, is we want to write an extra bit or an extra two bits. That's the timing bit. So if you do a 32 cycle write at one bit every four cycles, that's eight bits. So the standard bytes on a disk are all written on at 32 cycles. Every 32 cycles, you better be hitting that, the write register up there. If you instead do 36 cycles, so you write 8 bits and then you wait 36 cycles, it will write out all those 8 bits and then it'll write out an extra 0 bit. If you wait 40 cycles, it'll write out 2 extra bits. So that's how we can do different things. So this is just a little routine that waits 40 cycles before it writes, or 39 cycles before it writes, or 38 or 37. So we can do any number of cycles easily just by doing a J JSR. All right, so our routine is going to start after the data field has been found. It's going to kill a little bit of time to make sure that the, that the address field is completely passed. It's going to turn on write mode of the drive. Um, write some self-sync bytes. I'm not going to get into <coughs> counting these cycles with you because it's really not fun. Trust me that this, these FFs get written on a 40 cycle loop and so they ha will have two timing bits after them. Because this takes 35 cycles, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40 in the loop. Then we write the data uh, prolog, D5, AA, AD. We write a bunch of 96s just like the original disk. Then we write three E7s. One, two, three. This is a little bit off because, a little bit adjusted because we do the pause before we write the byte. And then we write an E7 with one timing bit, an E7 with two timing bits, a plain E7, an E7 with one timing, two timing. Why are we doing this? Quadit liberand, one more thing. Here's the E7 bit stream that we're trying to generate. An E7 followed by one timing bit. An E7 followed by two timing bits. An E7, no timing bit. E7, one timing bit, etc. That's what we're trying to generate. When we're finished with all that, we write a bunch more E7s at the end. We write the epilogue. We wait for the writes to finish. We turn off the motor. There's our code. All right, so let's see if we can write an E7 bit stream. So we want to catch this just after it has finished finding the the address field and it's found the right sector. So we want to patch this right here at uh, 
We just found sector D. So we want to patch this at 237. We're going to call our code instead of their code. So now after it finds the address field, it's going to jump to our code at 8000, which hopefully is still in memory, and it is. And here I cross my demo fingers and just hope that this works. Here we go. Do I have the right disk in? Okay. All right. So now when we run the protection check, what happens? So the famous E7 bitstream has been generated. Um, there's a couple cleanup steps that I did not have time to complete where we change all the epilogue bytes to FF. I think basically we need an advanced remuffin. I don't know if that exists. <laughs> so we're not going to go there, but the uh, kind of the interesting part is done. So that's it. We can play the game. The game is fun. I didn't know this game was fun before I tried to recrack it, uncrack it. Anyway, um, so that is uncracking. Um, how much time do I have? Um, I have a few people to thank before I go to questions. Um, Michael Mann gave me lots and lots and lots of advice about how to access the disk controller flags to get the A7 bitstream written out. Um, John Brooks was invaluable in those discussions as well, um, especially with some of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that Beneath Apple DOS puts in your head about writing to the drive. Uh, there's actually incorrect information in there, I think. Um, needless to say, 4AM for providing the original disk has been fantastic. And um, also a shout out to Jeff Saltzman for giving me a copy of Big Mac on floppy, which I needed. So thank you very much to those people. Um, are there any questions? Uh, no. We could do that. It would take time. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Just need a blank floppy. Plus, or no, we're doing dismuncher. Yeah, we're doing dismuncher. What is, oh, do, we can't tell dismuncher to do certain tracks. We need copy two plus. Other questions? We were trying to replicate the copying method that was originally on the original disk. Yeah. Could you put back on another copy protection method? Or is it just... You mean could I switch the copy protection to a different method on this right. disk? I could, but then I'd have to have code that checks that new method. 
So that would change the disk even more than 4AM changed it. My goal was to get to the original. You had a question? Yeah, you just make your assembler tools for write I would like to. Um, 4 am is interested in having a general E7 writer that you could just, you know, it would ask you, okay, what track and sector and offset do you want to put in E7 sequence? And it would just stick it there. Um, he also pointed out that there are lots of variations on the E7 sequence that you could do, and theoretically this could support that. I don't know if I'll get around to it or not. Depends on whether this is actually a useful thing or just a fun thing to do at Kansas Fest. Huh, that's interesting. So I may not have written track 11 correctly because it got an error. So this copy may not, may, may be even worse, but Hmm? Extra copy protection, yeah. Uh, let's see what happens when we boot it. Oh yeah, we should we should put back the original code so that it runs the copy protection without me typing 2OCG. Okay, so there, close enough. I have one more question time. All done. Okay, thank you very much.